Hello, hello one and all, and good evening and welcome. You may have noticed we've got a slightly new look there. Craig's been hard at work on the animations, thank you very much, sir. you see a few good new things tonight, it's going to be fun. Alright, so, basically this is Market Your Music 2021. So what we're going to do is that we're going to go through everything that you kind of need to know where... Again, getting your music out there, building your online presence, building your audiences, etc. And doing your social media in this, quite frankly, just wild time is concerned. How to do it properly and how to do it without basically having it completely overtake your life and get completely overwhelmed. And you end up doom scrolling the internet all day, which is obviously not very healthy, shall we say. So, all good. All good where that's concerned. So, we've got a special guest this evening. I mean, he's been on a few times now. And, you know, is uh, as we say in Liverpool in the UK, he's not so much a guest as a get. He's uh, definitely got his, his feet under the, uh, the NYT table. He's been with us since before all of this stuff. And, is, uh, you know, it's great to have him back because it's been a while since we've had... You know the the master of marketing that is Rory um, in 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 the place, shall we say? So it's going to do a couple of uh, hellos. Hello, Ray, Ray Gill, Roman. Hello, Nick, Yudi. Indeed. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night. I always feel like the Truman Show when I do this. Like, good evening, Kurt. Gar with those really weird green eyes. And uh, it's half past midnight where UD is. I admire the uh, I admire the commitment. Sandra, good to see you. Niall and Don, excellent. So yeah, plenty of people in the place this evening. So we're going to move on now to uh, bring in our special guest for the evening, as I mentioned before. And basically, it is my pleasure to not only introduce Rory. And we'll do a little bit of a recap on you know what Rory's experience is when he comes in in a second. But for those of you watching, because uh, this is going to go out as a Beyond the Studio podcast at some stage as well, you are going to see a brand new look for us. And here he is, Mr. Rory Palmero. How are you, sir? Yeah, good, mate. I was thinking when you were doing the intro before... I'm kind of like the broken, dusty synth that sits in the corner of the studio that you keep meaning to get back to, but can't quite remember what everything does. Yeah, the MIDI con- your MIDI connection's been quite faulty. One of the pins has been bent in for years, like, and I've only just gotten around to fixing it and getting it serviced. Uh, MIDI? I'm still using Firewire, mate. You probably don't have a port that fits me anymore. Well, I mean, I think we may be step away from that conversation before it goes completely <laughs> off the rails before we even get started, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so how you doing, yeah. mate? You okay? Yeah, yeah, good, good. Uh, living and thriving in lockdown and all all that kind of stuff. Yeah, tell but, me about uh, it. I can't complain. Indeed, indeed. So if you don't mind, for people who, because again, since the last time you won, we've had plenty of new members and you know, a lot of uh, a lot of new people have joined. Uh, do you fancy giving people a bit of a background in what you do, what your background is in the scene, who you've worked with, and why why you're here in such esteemed like sort of you know reverence this evening? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, so my background uh, has always kind of been in in clubs and music. Um, Cutting my teeth working for Cream as our operations and promotions manager out in Ibiza back in like circa 2007, something like that. Um, and then after leaving Ibiza, I then worked for the t shirt and record label Million Hands, which a few of you might remember. So we were doing a lot of partnerships with um, record labels uh, and artists, uh, people like Seth Troxler, Vision Quest, uh, Tuskegee Records, Martinez Brothers, uh, Dixon all those sorts of folks and working to produce t-shirts and putting on parties. Um, and that was, I guess, where I cut my marketing chops. Um, so experience growing an email list, uh, it was when Facebook marketing was really becoming a thing and Facebook ads. So we got into that quite early on. Um, and then we moved from there to defected records, uh, where I was a marketing manager for a couple of years. Um, and then I kind of left the music scene a little bit. I moved back up home to Liverpool, um started working for an actual digital marketing agency here um, and i guess got the official schooling um and then also 
uh, whilst I was doing that. Also was working with artists and uh, DJs and labels on a personal level, running a social media consultancy slash kind of mini agency for them. And it was kind of born out of that, I think, our path crossed because I realized there were so many talented artists out there and it really wasn't a level playing field. Um, you know, prior to Defected Records, I'd always assumed that you just made boss music and it, it got signed and gone to the top of the beatport charts and, and that was that. And you know, my time at Defected, I realized what it actually means to work a record and, you know, massive hits like MK and Storm Queen, you know, took years almost before they actually charted having been released. It wasn't just an overnight success and there was a lot of money that went into it. There was a lot of PR. Uh, there was a lot of kind of greasing of the wheels. Um, and I thought there's so many people out there that just don't have their eyes open to that and maybe have these false expectations or are great at music but really struggle to promote themselves. I think not everybody is a natural showman, is comfortable in front of the camera. You know, a lot of people will probably um, empathize with being quite introverted um, and maybe feel that that somehow sets them back a little bit in the game. So it was born out of that that I wanted to do something about it, set up the agency and then... It was one of the first events in Liverpool that uh, we were speaking on the same bill, weren't we, Paul? That's right, um, yeah. And we kind of started chatting and, and yeah, and the rest, as they say, is history. Indeed, indeed. And out of that first meeting, because it was the first ever event for Liverpool Audio Network uh, back in, like, I think, was it 2018 or something like that? 2017, something like that, something yeah. Like that yeah. And 17? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And, yeah, that was fantastic. And uh, my my masterclass on Able, because it was just uh, Ableton 10 was in beta. So it must have been 2017 because it was Ableton 10 was in beta and I did a whole thing on Ableton Wavetable, which is still now, is now one of the most popular videos on our YouTube channel still to this day. Uh, three years later, which is quite funny, and you know, you obviously pl- you know uh, spoke afterwards, and then after that, it was Mike Cave, right? It was indeed. Yeah, Mike, Mike of this parish as well, uh, who did who did an amazing masterclass for us uh, not too long ago. He's actually our first artist of you know external repute, shall we say? He did something on the platform. So out of that initial meeting, we put our heads together, and then we came up with the Market Your Music course, which is now available on the AAA platform. Yeah. It is indeed, yeah. <laughs> Shameless little plug there. Well, yeah, yeah, get it in yeah. there. Get it in there early. I think, you know, that was the kind of first iteration of of what we'd kind of learned between us, I think, over, you know, your experience in marketing labels um, and artist development and that side of things and kind of my experience with, uh, with kind of social media marketing. That was the first iteration of that. And, you know, it seems fitting. I think I think the principles still hold true, but I think the digital landscape's kind of changed recently and it's probably mm-hmm. about time that we... Um, we revisit that and uh, go for Market Your Music 2.0. Indeed, which this is going to be part of it. And obviously, we were talking just before we came on the air a little bit earlier because Rory also does the marketing and helps out with the marketing on MYT and very good he is at it too. And uh, it's really interesting because we were talking about just how much the landscape has shifted. It just obviously in the last year of you know what taking over the world and the fact that there's no parties and everything else and how that's placed a really specific microscope on the sustainability and the changing and shifting business model of the dance music industry in general. So, you know, this is going to be the beginning of a number of different pieces of content that we're going to do around that because one of the big focuses for MYT this year is on not only helping our members get signed to the very best labels they can, but it's about providing sustainable revenue models for artists as well. So you can make a sustainable living through selling your art and believe it or not, it is possible. And in a weird way, I suppose we could get into this sort of straight away a little bit. The model up until March of last year, where it was all about get your big record, get signed, and then get out on the road and get touring has obviously come to an end. And there's going to be a question mark about whether or not that's going to come back in future. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And even if it, you know, people will be like, oh, well, you know, I've seen parties in New Zealand happening. You know, there's footage of Josh Butler smashing it over there. Um, it's not going to come back in the same way. And it's going to take a while. And 
specifically when I say the same way, I mean, you know, capacity events are going to be really, really limited. So if you think about the knock on effect that's going to have on the number of ticket sales and then what that will mean for um, for your fees, if you know, if you're a touring DJ, you're not going to be able to charge the same because they're not going to be able to support it by having the same number of people in the club. They're not going to consume the same number of drinks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, that's straight away. You can see how that old school model is going to shift uh, and you know, whilst at best it might exist in some form, there's a good chance that it might just cease to exist altogether. Mm. So, yeah, definitely you need to change that. And then the other thing that we kind of talked around recently was the fact that if artists aren't on the road playing music, then what does that mean for you if you're not a DJ but you're a releasing artist? Then, in terms of your kind of records getting out there, because records aren't able to be worked in the same way, you're having to jump straight to radio which is obviously a much bigger leap, especially if you're, say, you're self-releasing and don't have that kind of um, that label plugger connections you might get working at a bigger label or releasing on a bigger label. Um, so there's a lot of kind of questions in, you know, should you still be releasing music at the moment? Should I wait? Um, I think that's one I've seen around quite a bit. Um, people holding back records. Um, and I think... You're going to be a long time waiting. <laughs> I think it's probably the quick answer on that one. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, you know, in talks of like, I mean, I, I love this word in in terms of like a specific cadence, if you will, of like a turnover of releases in situations like this. You know, what is a good sort of turnover? in this kind of environment, in your opinion? Because, I mean, I've been very much of that school of thought of, well, what's the point? You're making dance floor records for a dance floor that currently is either empty or non-existent. So I took the view last year that you'd be better off holding off and then obviously releasing in 2021. Now, the way to look in is that, for the most part, 2021 is probably going to be a wash as well. So that shifts the... That shifts the goalposts a little bit and it shifts the strategy a little bit. So, you know, put yourself in the shoes of an artist, which of course you are as well, because you are part of one half of, you know, Henry Street Social with hashtag UK Billy scene. And uh, I had to get that in there. You're right, Will, if you're listening. Um, basically, um, you know, it, it does it does shift it. So putting your artist hat on for a second, you know, what would be your approach to releasing music in this kind of reality at the moment? So I think um, I think when we thought this was going to be done by September last year, it made complete sense to hold back and just sit on records and stockpile them. Uh, and it's all you know something I'd always advise is when approaching labels is having a few records up your sleeve and having like a little bit of a back catalogue of unreleased work. Um, that's something that's always I've found personally that labels look upon quite favourably. Um, and you can do the kind of Mayor James Cole thing where you just have like strong release after strong release, all in you know almost like a monthly succession um, and you can build up momentum. But I think, you know, the time for stockpiling is probably over because you'll be a long time dead. Um, so I think my advice now would be to take advantage of what regularly releasing music does. And what it does is it builds momentum. Um, you gain, hopefully gain a little bit of traction with the first record and then you can build on that and you can build on that and you can kind of move yourself up those incremental steps. And I think that still holds true. And then the other thing is it gets you into that that cycle and builds a habit of, first of all, finishing records. Because mm. I think until you send a record out to a label, there's always that thing in the back of your mind of, oh, I might just come back to that and just tweak it a little bit. And you never get into the process of shipping your art. Mm. Um, and I think that's something really important to, to get nailed and to you know, be quite professional about from the get-go. So I think mm. there's be really good reasons why you shouldn't sit on music currently. Um, and to build on that a little bit more, I think it's less now about looking to send music to labels and more about taking a bit of a DIY punk ethos to it and almost look at how the music scene was back in the kind of the misty, misty eyed heydays of the 80s when it was about, you know, it was about standing for something and mm. anti Thatcherism and it was a revolt against very similar times that we're in now of like political mm -hmm. instability, civil unrest, people struggling financially. So we've got the kind of the darker side of what we perceive as a heyday, but we've also, my prediction is we're coming into the, 
the wide open blue yonder and the opportunity that was also and a little bit of the naivety that was also found in the scene back then mm. now i think you're totally right because obviously with tour and being completely off the table that's just the lion's share of the previous model's revenue completely gone so therefore mm. as we said just now it's about looking at that punk ethos in order to potentially either self-release maybe even start a label of your own but to be able to do it in a way where you can obviously have full control over what happens to the music and find a revenue model based on building an audience that you can communicate with directly you don't really need a platform so to speak although they help to actually attract people into that ecosystem if you will of direct conversation but then being able to funnel it through to a platform where you can make the vast majority if not all of the money and i think that's a really exciting thing yeah 100 percent. and the the basic kind of fan model that we talk about in market your music uh about how you kind of you've got the awareness level so traditional marketing funnels are like upside down triangles upside down pyramids and you start at the top and it's like you pour people in the top and then eventually get down to the bottom and the idea being is you attract people and with this top tier it's about using platforms where people can consume your music for free and discover you easily Hmm. so generally you're looking at platforms like youtube and your streaming services but obviously you're not going to make a fortune there because it's like fractions of pence but the idea being you then use some sort of social media platforms that allow you to tell your story interact with your fans a little bit Hmm. build that relationship so that tends to be Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, they kind of sit in the middle. Uh, and then at the bottom, you're trying to get people to go on to sort of the, the inner circle. And this is where you might hear people talk about your thousand true fans and the concept being you only need a thousand true fans to make a living from being an artist. And so this is where they come in. Once you've kind of, you've been nurturing these people and taking them on the journey with you, um, this is where hopefully you get those people to move across onto say like an email list or you know a whatsapp group or that sort of platform where you own the audience yourself you're not having to pay to reach them um and this is where hopefully these are the people that are going to buy you know come to see you every time you play in the hotel buy every release and they'll get the digital and the vinyl and if you happen to do like a double fold with a free t-shirt and a poster they'll buy that as well and Mm -hmm. so you're starting to see platforms like Bandcamp, which kind of exist in that sort of space really come to the forefront now especially because as we talked about there's this kind of diy ethos creeping back in and i guess it's you know if you want validation that that's you know more so the fact that paul and i are talking about it here you can see this in real in (laughs) real life outside the music industry things like um the fact uh things like only fans and that sort of thing people are turning to other channels as a way of commoditizing themselves and looking to get people to that kind of super fan level where rather than just kind of googling tits it's like oh i'm actually going to look at you know somebody and i'm going to pay them um so it's you know it's much happening it's happening outside of our industry as well it's a cultural shift i'm not going to ask you how how you know so much about only fans (laughs) <laughs> not going there at all i was gonna say i've seen your account don't play coy with me well you know you gotta have a side hustle haven't you do you know what i mean i mean you get to my age looking like me i mean why so, wouldn't you do you know what i mean dream. housewife's choice over here mate do you know what i mean <laughs> i know me market well, you know. i know what me fan you personas know, are i know what my funnel is <laughs> <laughs> baby fetuses don't come cheap well i mean you tell me <laughs> <laughs> but but again we'll, we'll we'll leave that out of there but it's it's a really interesting thing because I, I read a really interesting article over the weekend and it, i think one of the things we've also spoken about offline at length which is worth a discussion now is the fact that you know the the different platforms all have their place and i think there is somewhat of a lack of awareness around what those platforms are doing and what they are here to serve and what audiences they're there to serve so it's great having you know say for example a beatport number one but the best thing and also the most challenging thing about beatport is that it is effectively a forum of djs buying other djs music and that's not a bad thing i don't mean that as a criticism but as an artist who might want to you know create more of a, a mainstream you know awareness for their art then you're looking towards 
a streaming platform like a Spotify or an Apple Music. And there was a really interesting article in The Guardian over the weekend talking about, you know, Spotify's royalty rates and stuff like that, because obviously they're quite small. That's not news in any situation at all. But that's okay in the context of, well, what is it that I'm trying to do on Spotify? And I feel like there is, again, a bit of a misunderstanding about how to leverage these platforms, because the, the killer line in this article was... Spotify don't sell music. They sell advertising. But what they're doing in order to attract enough attention to sell the advertising is using your music as a means to garner enough, as Gary Vaynerchuk would put it, attention arbitrage, basically, where Mm. they can use your music in order to make the money that they're looking to make, which is through advertising. And that's okay as long as that is in line with the rules of engagement of what you're looking for from a platform like spotify so again if you're looking to generate mainstream awareness or wider awareness outside of just your niche then spotify is a great option for you if you're looking for more dj centric awareness and more dj support then something like bport's going to be great and if you want to create that real audience for yourself and create that sustainable revenue model then Bandcamp is there but they all can work together as an entire ecosystem which effectively brings more and more people into that inner circle what do you think yeah definitely it's about using the tools and i think you know you look at any platform today that's the 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 builds sort of communities or garners attention essentially that is the business model isn't it Hmm. um of a best selling out with advertising um and we've seen it happen with ads being introduced across all sorts of platforms where they'd previously said oh we're not going to allow advertising um i saw something interesting the other day uh browsing through facebook and people were talking about using facebook adverts to drive spotify listens yeah um and then obviously complaining and being like oh well i'm paying you know 76 pence a click which you know isn't a bad cost per click Mm. for facebook in the kind of current climate Um, but obviously it's not a sustainable business model if you're only getting paid fractions of a pence per play and so this is i guess alludes to what you're talking about around people not understanding how to best use those platforms to leverage the desired outcome that they're looking for Mm. So I think you don't definitely, if we're not seeing club records getting the same play um, in clubs, I think what I have noticed on mainstream radio, you're hearing a lot more, for want of a better word, club music that you'd never hear before. Mm. Like, and I'm primed, like primetime Radio 1. Um, so that's where I think being present on streaming works really well and building up momentum and getting plays and getting, I guess, um, clout makes a lot of sense and going Mm. after that mainstream user because the life cycle on them is probably a little bit longer compared to your dj who you've got your kind of semi-professional to amateur djs who shop and beatport but once you get back past that you know you can bet your bottom dollar that richie horton downloaded for richie (laughs) um, doesn't shop on beatport (laughs) the majority of djs you speak to it tends to be records that have been given or they've got on promo Mm. So straight away, you're only in terms of the whole market that are ready to buy your music. It's only a very small section, and that section is always kind of shifting. And whilst there are obviously new DJs coming to it, who will then start buying records. You'll also having DJs that are then leaving that buyer persona or buyer type because they're then kind of moving past that stage. Mm. So I think that's why you're right, Paul. You've got to have all these pieces in play, um, but it's about how you manage that without you know, without just disappearing up your own ass and becoming a marketing guru. And remember <laughs> that actually you need to fire up Ableton or Logic sometime and write some records. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit like that uh, that, that old production meme, isn't it? About like I was told that using, you know, loops was cheating and all that. And then basically the guy was just a goat farmer at the end to make drum skins. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it can definitely happen. And and again, like that, you touched upon it before. And again, I don't want to get into a whole sort of like, you know, ranty, ranty banty about it all, if you know what I mean, about how people who, you know, do disappear up their arsehole, so to speak, and become a marketing person, oftentimes have results that 
other artists who focus on the music maybe don't get because of the fact that they're so in tune with the marketing side of things and maybe the music's not quite, you know, up to, to where it is, if you know what I mean, or where it, where it could be, so to speak, which obviously plays a little bit against, you know, our ethos as, you know, advising people on marketing and branding strategy, which is nothing moves the needle. And again, I want to stress this. Even though we talk about a lot of this stuff and getting these platforms right and getting these pillars right on your, you know, your artistic and your your branding journey, nothing moves the needle more than a big record. So that should always be the first and foremost yeah. thing. So yeah. Yeah. and that's why you know we never really delved into kind of Facebook ad strategy or anything like that in the market your music course because. You know, quite frankly, if you're at that stage where you're kind of plowing money into it, you, you'd you hope that you're releasing on labels that are doing that for you. Mm. You know, I think there's much more time or much more val- valuable time to be spent honing your craft as an artist, whether that be mm. as a DJ or as an artist um, in terms of like producing. Um, I think there's a kind of a time and a place for it. And so, yeah, I always kind of shy away from it when I see various, you know, social media groups t- talking about kind of music and marketing and people getting like really, really kind of technical with it. I think it's about equipping people with a solid foundation and an understanding so that they give their music the best chance um, whilst, you know, whilst still being able to write music, mm. work from home you know have relationships and all you know all these other things that make us a well-rounded human being yeah totally because it's very very easy to get lost in it and it's very easy to you know get completely overwhelmed by it all and feel like that that is like a full-time job in and of itself which is something we're going to come on to a little bit later on we're going to talk about strategies on how you can still obviously engage on these platforms how to approach them correctly but do it in a way where it's efficient and do it in a way where you can still maximize the impact but you can batch those tasks and effectively plan your life in advance so to speak yeah yeah definitely it's uh, yeah as you say it's like it's uh batching up tasks and setting setting kind of routines and habits that are going to make things really really quick and easy for you Mm. Um, and also kind of automatic so you're not having to use real brain power to remember to do things or having to rely on willpower if it's something that you know doesn't come naturally to you you're having to really drag yourself to do it you know if you can make it a routine then you it leaves the willpower free to be consumed for you know getting in the studio and (laughs) <laughs> breaking out of the loop and actually putting something down into an arrangement and all those other things that we fight against yeah exactly all that all those other good bits of resistance that you know sometimes we use uh social media marketing for our music as almost like an avoidance tactic of really that's, yeah. that's the other thing as well you know so yeah we're going to get into all of that and we're going to explore specifically where things like facebook and instagram are concerned we're going to actually explore some tools so we'll bring them up on the screen a little bit later on and you know obviously we'll describe them for those sort of listening on the podcast a little bit later it's going to go through some comments from the uh, the live members who are watching here right now Clyde was actually the whole person that actually Clyde Ruse was was the person who really sort of switched me on to this because he actually didn't release anything on Beatport last year it's a really interesting strategy he basically doubled down on building his sort of whole thing on spotify as a way of again attracting the more sort of shall we say mainstream punter and as he puts here as poor as spotify royalties are i made far more last year from it by self-releasing rather than releasing on labels i'm sure some labels pay out royalties but i've never been paid from one so that is a very very interesting wrinkle you know, and that can get into things like deal structures and stuff. And you know, you've got to be sort of very careful what you sign as well. But I think Clyde, and I know this with other artists who I've been speaking to recently, who I'm not going to name on, on, on the podcast, but I know a number of artists recently have managed to be able to get control of their catalogs back. And again, this is where Bandcamp really comes into it again, because what they've been able to do is get their master rights back to a lot of their back catalogue and then sell them directly to their audiences using Bandcamp. And a lot of them are making decent money doing that because they've got 
pre-existing audiences from the time before, shall we say, and they have an ability to communicate directly with them through email. And as you mentioned, the other thing I was going to talk to you about is you mentioned the WhatsApp group, and I thought to myself, hmm, is it going to be WhatsApp for much longer, the way it's going? Is it going to be things like, you know, Signal and Telegram groups as well, which is going to be another interesting conversation uh, in the next few months? But the whole thing with Bandcamp is they, they really kind of did very well through the first stages of this first year of the pandemic because they were very much clearly positioned as on the artist's side and I think that's a really really interesting part and one of the things that you know people watching this or listening to this might not know is the sheer range of things that you can sell on Bandcamp it effectively becomes a bit of a one-stop shop I mean we were looking just before we came on air and you know, we was I was surprised to find out that they'll cut vinyl for you. Yeah, yeah. It seems like they've taken the the kind of drop printing model, like t shirt model that Printify and Printful and people like that have done, uh, and it seems like they'll front the costs up front for vinyl, uh, which is incredible. But I, yeah, exactly that, Paul. What what they seem to be doing is ta- offering the full kind of music business model and this was something defected records were always very good at mm. and it's part of the reason for the longevity is that they didn't never saw themselves as just a record label that was just one part of the business they also had an artist management label or business sector they also had um the touring side of the business they had the agent artist agency side of the business um so it was all kind of wrapped up and obviously had the events and things and i think it all kind of ties back together what we're saying about the kind of DIY punk ethos, but these are platforms that enable you to do this that exists now and have never made it easier. And it's all happening in the one kind of sinks up place. Mm. So you're even saying that they, you can sell tickets and things there now as well. I believe so. I believe so. I would have to double check on that to be honest with you. But when we had the store running, when we still have the store running on chapter 24, you know, we were able to sell our physical merch. So our vinyl, which back in the days when, you know, Bandcamp weren't doing that. We had to kind of like front the cost for that ourselves, which, you know, is a risk going forward, you know, in terms of, you know, if you get it wrong, you end up with a room of unsold vinyl and nobody to sell it to because nobody wants it. But, you know, the the actual merch, like our T-shirts and hoodies and stuff as well, you know, we and our digital downloads as well, which, which was fantastic. And we found that our most committed followers because they wanted us and they were very conscious like that part of our audience was very very conscious about we want the label to succeed we want it to be sustainable because i can tell you you know as being one third of a team that ran a very impactful label it's it's a labor of love and you can't expect to make money on it with the way that a lot of it is structured but platforms like bandcamp nowadays do give you a chance at a sustainable revenue model but again it's it's having two parts of it right you've got to have the ability to create the audience to be able to plug into that ecosystem so you can then obviously drive people's attention into the appropriate place for where they can you know monetarily and economically speaking do you the best good as a label and as an artist as well yeah, hundred percent, and it's that's the same the world over. With you thinking about the way Instagram influencers work, it's the same thing. It's building up an audience that are engaged, and then selling that attention. Um, to put it into music terms, if you look at Bicep, you know they started off when it was a blog called Film My Bicep, mm-hmm. and what they did there was they leveraged the fact they had excellent musical taste to create a blog of obscure records. So you'd find you know DJs far and wide, and just audio files would be regularly visiting the blog just to find all these kind of hidden gems. And they varied from like obscure Italo disco through to like old ravey stuff through to like new garagey things. And it was very much, you know, if you couldn't as a DJ, let's say you're not a producer and you can't get any money at the moment because you're not able to go out and play cassettes. This is an interesting case study of how you can apply your skill as a tastemaker and a curator to then create something that gathers attention. And then when they released film, my bicep zero zero one, it kind of sold out in less than a day because they had they spent the time building up this audience. Um, but also, I think the caveat in that is, you know, they were offering something of value up front. And in a world awash with, you know, so-called talentless influencers, I think it's quite important that you need to 
have something special in order to kind of cut through and provide value first and foremost. Otherwise, you know, people aren't going to flock to you. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a feeling that just because you, you know, you set up an Instagram account, you're like, oh, I'm going to have thousands of followers. But, you know, why should someone follow you versus the next person? You need to be something, offering something different enough and of, you know, value in order for that to happen. Mm. And I think it does go back to that punk ethos once again, what you're saying about being unique and being a bit of an outlier and being effectively yourself, which I know is such a redundant piece of advice, which is, oh, just be yourself, you know, that kind of thing. But ultimately, you know, it really is an interesting point to make because what what i found is there's this kind of like widespread desire to conform and there's lots of little kind of insidious and quite sort of unconscious ways that we do this and and we kind of limit ourselves through our own ambitions in a weird way because we want to get signed to the biggest labels possible therefore we feel this kind of unconscious pressure to conform to the perceived and acceptable standards of what that label is looking for you know and i've heard lots of things from you know certain labels only looking for a particular style of music which is totally fine but all the way over to like certain labels in the world who operate more in sort of the edm sphere actually having like a look policy and they, <laughs> like i've got a friend and again no, none of these people are going to be named but i've got a friend who put a, a, a track together or put an EP together for a very big label and you know they were interested in it, they wanted to sign it and stuff and then what happened was they sent he sent his press shots over and then they refused to sign the, the record because he looked too old yeah. for the genre because it basically wow. just didn't fit like what we want to promote and it was like right okay this is very very weird so you know I totally agree with you where you know what you're saying is concerned because it's important rather than feel that need to conform which can actually like limit and almost diminish the music that you make because you kind of sat there with this thing in the back of your head of what is this person going to think when I send this in and it can be a weird thing because I've been on the other side of that situation where you know when we've done things with chapter 24 and listened to demos and stuff we've we've had a lot of people kind of send demos in and it's really funny because what used to happen was people used to send demos in and they'd go, right, I, my big ambition in life is to get on Chapter 24. And I have written these three tracks. I've written this EP specifically for you. And like, this is the only thing that matters to me. And I want to be on your label and that's it. And that's what I've done this in mind of. And you know, the, the tragic thing is, mate, is that like consistently they were the worst demos that we got. Because what what they were doing, they were kind of like, you know, these artists were sat there trying to imagine what I'm looking for when they haven't even met me, never mind, understood my taste in music. And the truth of the matter is, is that I don't even know what I'm looking for. I only know it when I find it. <laughs> and it's like, you're I mean, trying like to hit a moving goalpost that is strapped to the back of a racehorse running in diagonals. Yeah. That seems like a, a better case scenario than <laughs> what normally happens. At least they were thinking about it there. What often happens, and, uh, you know, I'll come back to this, the biggest mistake I've made personally, but when you think about the way that labels release music, quite often the music that you hear that's come out like released last week that was signed like months and months ago mm. so what the AR and like label bosses have in their mind for where they want to take the label sonically is six months ahead let's say of what your target that you're aiming at on the back of Paul's racehorse mm. so so you're going to be you know, screwed from the start but I was going to say that you know I think what we're talking about here is if I was to kind of do some soul searching, the biggest mistake and the biggest regret I have as an artist is wasting, you know, the the vast majority of your kind of short career trying to write music that I thought was popular. Mm. And the records that we had the most success at and did the best on Beatport were always the records that we weren't trying to sound like what we thought was kind of cool. Mm. Or even records that we would play in our sets 
it was just like, and you know, I think Patrice was it Patrice who came out with the brilliant quote uh, mm. earlier last year. Yeah, that that and episode like, came out yesterday on on the plot on the podcast platform. We talked about it, yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Anybody who's watching this, give that a listen because I was just like, Christ, I wish I'd heard that ten years ago. Like it, it was almost like someone was kind of like washed my sins away. I was like, it's okay. <laughs> mm. But it was yeah, it was a game changer for anyone kind of starting out in the middle of their kind of their career. I highly recommend that because no one needs another so and so. You want to be yourself, and if you think about any of the kind of artists that have become synonymous with genres um i was going to use bicep again i do live listen to other artists other than bicep by the way <laughs> this edition of <laughs> beyond the studio is brought to you in association with bicep <laughs> <laughs> but you think about like yeah artists that define sounds um like joy orbison and i guess that kind of proto uh dubstep see i'm musically diverse um <laughs> They were the first people to do it, and they didn't. They weren't aiming at a sound. They mm. were just doing them and taking all the influences, putting it together, and coming up with something that was different. And then you're always going to get a couple of artists that kind of manage to ride on the coattails, but they tend to be artists that are very close to that inner hub, that mm. kind of nucleus of like that scene, mm. and they'll kind of get cut through. But then you've got like if that's like three percent, you've got the other ninety-seven percent of people who hear the sound and go oh yeah that's so cool and try and make these copycat records mm. you're just never going to get away because it's just so awash the label's already moved on they've already heard it you know 10 other people that day hit mm. them up on soundcloud mm. with links and it's like yeah it's that's to- you're totally right yeah. mate and and it's funny because reflecting on that like obviously within recent times you know i had a, a relatively successful release on bedrock and i can tell you when i made those tracks that that had not even figured in my thinking at all. I was too busy writing the things to kind of get it right, and I was just going for a particular idea, a particular concept, uh, you know, a completely unrelated thing to I am going to produce this thing in order to get on this platform to get me to the next stage which is so, not artistic thinking as far as i'm concerned you know no but here's a here's a question so to someone then who goes okay cool right paul right rory um you're making a little bit of sense here i'm making some music let's say they build up you know three three tracks six tracks when it comes to shopping that music then around to different labels what would your advice be then how do you then take the tracks that you haven't aimed at anything do you then look for labels that sounds similar but then being aware that maybe they've moved on and in six months time that's not what they're looking for mm. how do you then go about shopping those that music around it's an interesting thing because uh again like just to i'll give you a couple of different bits of perspective here where my bedrock release was concerned that happened through a quirk of fate i literally didn't get the opportunity to shop those tracks around because through a, a, a lovely you know quirk of fate and, and friendship and opportunity the tracks landed in john's inbox and he loved them so it was more about the network that i had and almost getting a little bit of third party validation like it wasn't me who was submitting it to the label it was somebody else who that person trusted so it was a really interesting situation now if I had my time again and it was more of a deliberate process, my approach is slightly different in that rather than shopping to labels, what I would personally do, and again, it's different at the moment because obviously there's no gigs and stuff like that, but assuming all things remain equal and you know, there's festivals and gigs and stuff, my approach would have been to, rather than send to labels, I would have just sent to DJs. Mm-hmm. So obviously I'm lucky because and i'm fortunate because i've built up a quite significant network of friends and colleagues and contacts in the industry so i would be very deliberate very laser focused about it and then send the tracks to just like the 10 djs that i think are most deserving or are most likely to play it from there i would then look at right you know, what happened with, again, to go back to the Bedrock release, I, I was getting video sent to me of, like, Digweed playing it at Fabric. 
I was getting video of like Sasha and Ziggy playing it in you know Miami at Ultra and all these other DJs like you know Luke Brancaccio who helped me get it signed and Dave Seaman and a whole host of other people all playing it at various points in the world. Now, if that was an unsigned record, I can use that as collateral to go to bigger labels and say, look, you know, such and such is playing it. It's getting this kind of response rather than it being a cold approach. If you know what mm. I mean. And also, yeah. And also there's people out there who are monitoring those channels. So uh, the Lee Walker record freak like me, that ended up getting signed to Defective Records because we'd seen the YouTube video of Marco Carolla playing uh, Amnesia Closing mm -hmm. uh, and the massive sit down and everything. And we were like, oh my God, like seeing that kind of reaction in a club and the fact the video was like, had hundreds of thousands of, of views, that was the validation that as a label, we were looking at and being like, there's something in this record. Mm -hmm. So then we were like, okay, well, how do we get it signed? Um, how do we get the sample cleared? You know, with these, all this process. And I think that ended up taking about a year itself and kind of reaching out, contacting the artist and mm. being like, we want to sign this to then kind of undo and unravel all that red tape. Mm. Took about a year, but the, very much a case of a record that was never sent to a record label being like, hey, sign this. It was a case of getting it into the right DJ's hands, as you say, and then using that almost like social proof that comes from uh, an artist working a record and there being footage mm. of the effect that record has on the dance floor. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. And it's interesting because it goes back to what we were saying before about, you know, do these DJs shop on Beatport? Well, no, they don't really by and large because they don't have time and they get sent a lot of music for free. In the case of like the Richie Hortons of this world, they have a team of people who go through, you know, and, and filter the promos and everything else. So where their music predominantly comes from is from their inner circle, from their family of artists. And mm. the best thing you can do is be, even if it's just with one DJ or one person, and it can literally be, you know, at a, at a club or an event or you know you see solomon putting the spice on it walking down the street you know you <laughs> you, you, know, you throw the usb stick and then you see what happens you know because that does actually you know result in 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 club play it does result in it because you know if you've got if you've got that family inner circle kind of connection then it's going to get you much further as i've mentioned before you know, then send into demos at recordlabel.com. You, mm. you know, and, and for me, like what kind of that, you know, my whole experience with Bedrock was, was like that because I was, I was obviously kind of tangentially connected already and it just needs that little bit of a tip over the edge and, that, and that's how it happened. And, you know, you mentioned as well about release schedules and stuff like that was signed in like the October the year before it came out in the April. So I had to literally sit there for like six, seven months and bite me tongue until like <sighs> it was time to say it was actually happening, which was for somebody who's not short of a word, it's kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a walk, I'm a walk and spoiler alert in, in real life. Do you know what I mean? So there's difficult enough as it is, but it's an interesting thing as well. Cause it, br I think it brings this topic brings everything that we're talking about together to an extent because it's about, you know, I, I, I got a real education working with John on that release because, you know, I was coming to him with all these ideas and I was saying to him, you know, I know all of these blogs and, you know, I know all these people who can do as like really big, like SoundCloud premieres, and like DJ Mag and Mix Mag and stuff. And he was like, hell no, we're doing, we're doing none of that. We're doing absolutely none of that. You will share the link that we give you. And it was, all it was, was the pre-order link on Beatport. So wow. he basically well, said every single communication with a link, whether it's from my channel, Bedrock's channel, your channels or anyone else's is going to go there. And if you think about it, it's very clever because it's his dig we smashing the back doors off fabric at six in the morning to this record. If you want it, it's here. Click the pre-order link. And what happens is that that, release opened on melodic techno number two behind art bat mm -hmm. because they didn't muddy the water they like literally were like no everything goes to that link we get that whole thing going first and foremost 
and then as i say it opened up as a genre like number two and i think it was overall release as number 25 so it shows you having that clear idea of where to funnel people to in order to get the impact and the results that you're after on a given platform is very very important but as Roman Gills just said here, a key part of the formula in all of this is to have an audience. If the audience is your mum or dad or every other relative or friend, and I think you've spoken about this before, Rory, then that also makes it difficult. What is the recommended way to build an audience? Oh, wow. Uh, well, this is good because this enables me to backtrack a little bit to uh, something I wanted to talk about before which was, you know, how do you get onto that inner circle? Mm-hmm. How do you kind of approach artists? So maybe let's look at, we'll look at that and then we'll look at building kind of maybe a digital audience as well. Cool. So we'll do real world and then digital. Um, because the real world thing is something I, I've always struggled with, but I'm lucky enough to have uh, a studio partner who is incredibly good at being a DJ whisperer and just befriending anyone. Um, so the tips I've learned from watching him work over the years is it's generally not a good idea if you do see Solomon walking down the street to straight away go over and be like, you know, I've been following Dynamic for this long and then just kind of spit into his ear. Hmm. Generally, you want to engage him with something, be kind of human about it. So um, a good example of this, if you've never done it before, is, you know, pick your artists, let's say on Instagram, comment on their posts. And don't just kind of comment with like love this or something really generic like comment with something like or three fire emojis show... <laughs> three <laughs> exactly <laughs> comment with something of like kind of real kind of value don't use the, the word also... bro <laughs> <laughs> or so fam also, like, or lit designed to, <laughs> to elicit a response so like you know asking a question asking open-ended questions is a really good one so mm. whether it be asking about what like so the way i met cozy d was because there was a particular track on what i think it was his uh Ibiza voice podcast and i couldn't find it anywhere been searching and searching and i reached out to him on soundcloud and just commented tagging and being like i've been hunting for this track forever it turned out it was on his label and we kind of got chatting from that and so just by kind of engaging here and not kind of straight away trying to ram the music down the throat is a really good way to kind of engage with artists mm-hmm. um ultimately everyone's playing the same game and so generally speaking people are going to be responsive because they know that engagement on their social posts is a good thing um and even you you know you're asking interesting questions and stuff people are going to like enjoy responding to it rather than mm. having to find a way to respond to three or fire emojis which is really quite hard after the fourth or fifth one <laughs> so i think first we'll reach out like that Try not to engage him straight away on listening to your music. Try and provide a bit of value first is really good. And just be quite honest and open about it. Like if you, you know, if you like football and they support the same team, talk about football, talk about anything other than music. Mm. And then, you know, only once you've had Sunday dinner with them, you've met the family, you're probably dating the sister, <laughs> then it's like, to get the USB stick out and be like, oh, by the way, like I've just been mucking around in the studio. I just would really appreciate your feedback. Mm. And that's the key there. Not so much the date and the sister, but they're asking for kind of feedback. Mm. Not asking, to, like, could you give this to your label or anything like that. Just feedback's really good because it just opens up that dialogue. And if the music is good enough, they will take it there mm. or they'll be playing. They don't need you to say, please, can you do this? If the music's good enough, they'll do it. No, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly my experience with, you know, not only working with the likes of Sasha, but just being friends with them now for a number of years and you know that whole working relationship on the on the last album on scene delete was predicated on the fact that me and him knew each other quite well were friends and that was based off the fact that we didn't when i saw him at gigs or you know i used to speak to him online the last thing we would talk about was music it was football like you say cooking his you know his family other stuff that would come up you know and just just being a normal person, you know? And I think it's worth saying at this point that I figured out a long time ago from my approaches, because, you know, again, I'm similar. I'm like a cream alumni as well from, shall we say, a much uh, a much older vintage, shall we say. <laughs> uh, I was, like, you know, working there in, like, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002. And you, you realise that it's not about what those people can do for you. 
It's about what you can do for them. And it's how can you solve a problem for them? How can you make their experience a little more entertaining, a little lighter, a little more authentic by the interactions that you have? How can you contribute to their dynamic? And, you know, you would think that way, whether or not it was your friends on the dance floor or, you know, the old lady that you help across the street with their shopping, you know? It's the same thing of don't think in terms of what what can I get out of this person because they're a famous artist and they could do things for me. It's a very easy thing to fall into. And I say this as somebody who's fallen into that trap over the years and, and you know, kind of didn't feel good about it. And it wasn't until I spent enough time around well-known artists that I understood that they're just the same as everybody else and they have the same social desires as everyone else you know when i met massio plex back in 2015 at creamfields it was literally he was like he finished his set and you know people are kind of bombarding him and photos and photos and photos and you know after a half an hour you could tell it was kind of grinding on him a little bit so i just walked up to him and went don't want your fucking photo mate just want to say hello and he just he almost looked at me and went oh my god a normal person (laughs) <laughs> and then that triggered the conversation and you know a conversation he probably doesn't remember but you know it was a uh, we ended up having a fun a fun night together and it wasn't because i wanted anything from him it was because i just wanted to sort of say hello and get to know him and see what kind of person he was more than anything and i think it's very easy in the drive to i want to succeed i want to get signed i want this stuff we forget that these people are human beings as well so my main piece of advice on that front is to just hold in your mind that, you know, sounds corny, but they're somebody's brother, sister, husband, wife, friend, auntie, uncle, parent, whatever. Mm, definitely. I think a really good, actionable thing there for people to take away when they're thinking, oh, you know, how can I provide value for somebody? Um, a quick one that I found works really well is when we could go to gigs getting good video footage if you get good video footage of your artist and then say to them oh i've got this boss video would you like me to send it to you mm-hmm. um and that just opens up those kind of the conversation there even obviously if we're not doing gigs anymore then you know if you happen to see footage online or a good press you know good article or anything like that anything you know that they might find a value and send it to them be like oh, i saw this i thought you might want it or did you see so and so played played your music on this this show mm. anything like that it's just a really quick and simple way for you to deliver value without feeling too kind of stalkery yeah and you know hopefully that can open up the uh, the doors for conversation for you i mean i'll even i'll even give you an example of that yesterday i mean obviously people listening to this know that me and christoph are, are, are decent friends like and we've known each other for a long time so it's a little bit beyond that situation but still I sent him uh, a screen grab of a local news article yesterday saying Storm Christoph is set to wreck the north of England. And I sent (laughs) it to him and I said, I mean, I know your essential mix was good, mate, but this is a bit, like, ridiculous, like, you know? And he just, and he replied, like, with about 15 laughing emojis saying, like, they can't even spell my name right, the bastards. You know, and 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 but but and, and again, like not not like oh, but while you're here, can you just listen to me demo? <laughs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? It's just like yeah, you're all right, mate. How's it going? Da, 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 da. You know, it's just but be like just be be a no, be a normal, well-adjusted social animal, basically. That's what it's yeah. about, ultimately. Like, because the end of the day, you know, Richie Orton still got to take the bins out, mate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it is. It is what it yeah. is. Like so. So in terms of audience building, then, like mm. obviously you were saying, being part of that inner circle, I think that that's a really, really well defined point. And I love that. By the way, I love that about. Oh, if you're in a club, like I'll get footage and I'll, I'll offer to send it to the, the artist. I think that's a a really, really nice way to look at it. So in terms of like generally building an audience, then what is the uh, the Rory point of view on that? Shall we say? So it's it's tricky. <laughs> let's let's not pull any punches here. It's really tricky. Mm. I think building an audience on Facebook. What happens is, I guess to give a little bit of background, um, the newer the platform, and this is a rough rule of thumb, the easier it is to build a, an audience because there's less people on it. 
so it's much easier to get your content seen and therefore mm. it's easier to grow and then because people more and more people are joining the platform um generally the algorithms are geared towards growth and people seeing your content so that's why it was much easier to kind of grow on facebook organically when you know organic reach was decent now that it's less than one percent um it's obviously much harder because it's much more saturated so with the gary v thing it's always kind of good almost to prospect a little bit and have a little bit of presence on he would say all channels because you never know what's going to blow up obviously we're not marketers we're producers and djs so we can't be on every channel and we just don't have the time um we need to kind of pick our battles a little bit more um essentially to grow an audience you need to be putting content that provides value and entertains in some ways on a platform and you have to have people outside of your current follower base see that now that can come from from people sharing it with their group or you can pay to kind of get that reach and reach into other groups um obviously one involves money the organic page sharing version is obviously preferable um so how do we do that well generally stuff that gets shared is things that either cause people to laugh so that's where your dog and cat memes come in or your cat flicks and pills that's why meme accounts seem to grow really quickly because they're just really funny and people naturally share them to their friends um you know it's much harder to get people to share your you know two hour soundcloud odyssey um that's unfortunately the hard to kind of sell um but if you have an amazing record as we talked about before put out an amazing record in your socials and your audience are going to blow up overnight but you know what can you do in the meantime what can you do until that record comes i think there's a couple of kind of strategies you can use if we're saying that in order to grow an audience we need to get reach and get in front of new people who haven't seen us before then we need to find shareable content um so one strategy that we've used to some effect is for every kind of time you put out a bit of self-promotional content so listen to my new track that sort of thing how can you be putting out content that provides value and then also how can you be putting out content that also is geared towards being kind of shareable and get in front of new people so i think that's why it's nice if you think about how you share on your own personal accounts and sort of content you do there's no reason why you can't do that to varying degrees on your artist channels so so maybe we always push for and we've done it with kind of myt it's why we we still put up like producer memes and stuff because it's a really good content that we know is going to get that extra reach and get in front of those people who aren't fans of us and that's where you get the growth it's people who aren't fans or followers mm. seeing it liking the content going to the page and being like oh, okay well this is what it's about yeah i'm into that um i'd say that's how to kind of do it organically um definitely pick a channel that's kind of newer and kind of has better organic reach and growth so instagram over facebook and probably tiktok over instagram um i would say again it's the kind of it's where the attention is um, there's kind of arg arguments for and against and why perhaps you need to think about your target audience but then you're getting into that really kind of marketeer mindset again of being mm -hmm. like okay well you know if i'm producing um bedouin house what is the channel that has the most bedouin house you know fans mm. um so which is kind of taking a little bit too far but let's say it is instagram there's definitely a few kind of growth hacky tactics that you can use the whole follow and follow thing which we talk about on um and marketing your music um and how to develop that past a really spammy thing of just basically going for bigger accounts going into their fans and just being like follow 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 mm what we're saying is try and elevate it to something that's a little bit more thought out a little bit more considered mm. where you're looking for you know artists who are similar to you and have accounts that are much larger but then going and finding content that they're posting which is similar to the content you're posting on your channels and then people that have either liked it or even more so people that have commented and following those people because you can tell that they're active users and they're really engaged rather than you know going and following a thousand russian spam bots <laughs> that someone's paid for to like their account yeah um so you know i think there's, there's things like that you know it's it's hard it's not easy hmm. it's it's it takes time you know i think with you know something with the myt youtube channel it's a grind it's it's consistency and like anything hmm. in life consistency 
is one of the hardest things to do, but it's also what pays off. Yeah. Just, you know, day after day, just having that discipline to go and do something and repeat it. And you, what happens is you build up this momentum, you build up this pressure, and eventually you kind of almost break through. Mm. Um, no, that's totally right, mate. You're, you're totally correct. And the, the thing to think about as well is, like you were saying, about going back to offering something of value. I look at it from, obviously, NYT's perspective, but also from the perspective of the artist itself, themselves, and what they can offer, which is still within that musical realm that can be construed as something of value to generate an audience generally. So think about it. You know, what we do here at NYT is we offer some free downloads. You know, we offer free Ableton racks, free little, you know, mix down templates. Maybe it's like a journal that helps you set your goals for the year. You know, that kind of thing. And we generate our audience almost entirely organically off the back of setting up these little pipelines which offer something of value in exchange for a direct line into that person that is going to be interested in everything else that you've got so say for example if you know i had a a release coming out i would think about maybe doing a short video maybe on somewhere like TikTok or Instagram where I do like a quick track breakdown of like this is how it was made or say for example you could do a whole thing of right well I'm going to give away some samples that I've made from my library or some MIDI files or some synth presets or something like that and it would then go to a landing page which would then be again the exchange of email for said item for free then you can start to build an email ecosystem around that which then you can start to direct people towards other things that they might be interested in such as your releases on various labels your band camp as we talked about before we can do band camp exclusive releases so it's it's working out and understanding where these various pillars are because again you could do a longer form piece of content on something like the youtube element like on, on a youtube channel that you set up and i can say with absolute certainty we've had one video that just exploded on our channel and has got i think now almost like i think seven or eight years later it's got like you know nearly for a six minute tutorial video it's got like nearly like three hundred thousand hits and that to this day gets us referral to you know what we do here at MYT, whether it's free stuff or whatever. We were just remarking that we've you know that our free reverb has become quite popular, and that's born out from posting content on a platform in a way that appeals to people and it offers something of value. But that means we can then continue to offer value in different ways and means because you've got that direct line so again all of those things that i've just mentioned but on top of that you could do something like you know you mentioned like oh we need to get this sample cleared and this has come up in conversation again recently which is the concept of doing say an unofficial remix and rather than go through the whole torture of trying to get the sample cleared you could and would be not fully within your rights but you're you're fine where you can put that up as a free download but the free download is in exchange for an email address or you could even do that with an original track of your of yours but then obviously that email could long term be more lucrative for you than say getting a sale on beatport or getting a single sale on something like you know, Bandcamp or track source or whatever, or a bunch of streams on Spotify. So there's lots of different ways that you can look at this, where you can offer things of value to people that offer an insight into you as an artist, you as a voice, and then be able to offer something of value to them, which feels good for all parties. And it's not like, you know, going like I see a lot, like a lot of artists essentially, and, and again, this is not a criticism, but they're essentially, you know, just pleading with people to buy their record, which for me, it doesn't quite work. So, I mean, any sort of responses no. to that, mate? No, I, I definitely, I think, you know, there's platforms that are built 
to help you do exactly that. Like um, rather than having to build landing pages like Hype Edit or Hype Dip, mm-hmm. however you want to pronounce it, um, I think is really good. And it's it's created with a lot of kind of music marketing tools, but primarily gating uh, some sort of value offer. So whether that be samples or a bootleg or something in exchange for an action that you want. So whether it be a follow on SoundCloud or an email address, all these things. Um, and I think, you know, you can get kind of quite creative with it. That's one of the things we've seen since lockdown is artists looking for new ways to kind of make some money and, and build audiences perhaps outside of the audiences that they currently have in terms of people that would come and see them at gigs. So mm-hmm. we've had artists doing, as you said, track walkthroughs, giving away kind of like studio tips and stuff. Um, you know, I saw something today, uh, God, I don't remember the guy's name. But it was essentially like I, I hate DJ live streams or with a passion. Mm. But this was a um, this was a YouTube mix. But what I particularly liked about it was, and I think what elevated it above a lot of the kind of content out there was because it it was in a beautiful room, like it was kind of proper Scandi cool. It was vinyl. The decks were set up really nicely. It was shot on really nice camera angle, quite kind of high up, and it just was just cool. Like it was just kind of nice and it was polished and it was the sort of thing that you would just enjoy kind of looking at. And I think the the key there is the fact that I enjoyed the experience. I The, the value exchange there was the fact the music was great. It looked great and it was just nice. And I was, and I ended up following the channel and I subscribed to like maybe five YouTube channels. And one of those is NYT. So it just goes to show like if you try and create content, with the, the this concept of providing value for the end user in mind, that it really kind of goes a long way. Mm. And I don't think there's there's too many kind of shortcuts to it. And you see a lot a lot of kind of marketeers peddling kind of snake oil and being like, I'll double your account in you know just give me two hundred quid and be buying fake likes. And you know I'm not going to go into that because there's so much content in the past podcasts and stuff I've done where we talk about why that's the wrong thing to do. But anything kind of good and anything worth having, worth having takes time. Mm. And particularly if the focus here is trying to create an audience through which you can then create a sustainable revenue source, the quality of that audience is is directly connected to the quality of that kind of revenue. Mm. Uh, therefore, cheap likes aren't going to equate to much money. Um, but if you can really kind of focus on kind of like – crafting and building and nurturing that fan base and that's when you're going to see the biggest returns yeah and then that comes kind of we're we're kind of rounding the turn now into this is all great information but how do i do this without having a nervous breakdown in the process of trying to do this and make music at the same time and have a life (laughs) right but it's quite interesting what you mentioned there because one i suppose the primary thing and i mean i know you mentioned what you know, sort of gary vaynerchuk was saying about you should be on all platforms um i don't necessarily subscribe to that i think you know for me i've had or myt's had more success because we've kind of narrowed our focus towards this podcast you know the, these obviously live streams for triple a members all organic marketing efforts again doing you know organic value exchange if you want to call it that way and on top of that picking a pillar as again gary v would call it a pillar of content a platform that you know sits at the center of it all which is you know for us the youtube channel now for an artist Mm -hmm. it might be instagram might be tiktok might be facebook you know, it might be MySpace. You never know, but it's it's <laughs> all it's it's the, it's important to pick that main pillar that allows you to get that value over to people, but also allows you to get your voice over as an artist in the most appropriate way, both for you as the artist and as the brand, but also for the audience as well. So again a little bit of experimentation and a little bit of almost adopting like we were talking about you know the the book that i'm about to start reading this designing your life thing before we came on tonight uh applying almost like product design principles of design like looking at all of these platforms 
trying to kind of like design what they would look like ultimately and then picking the most appropriate one and then being able to almost recycle content where you know maybe your live stream on a video on a platform maybe it's a dj thing ends up as a podcast or your production breakdown ends up being a small a, you know, a bunch of smaller videos that you put on instagram for example, from a longer form piece of content on YouTube. You know, there's a number of different things you can do to be able to get the most out of the content that you create. And again, this is another great piece of like, you know, Gary V wisdom, which is, you know, think more in terms of documenting what you do rather than feeling like you have to create all of these very specific pieces of content. That was that was a big game changer for us on NYT a few mm. years ago yeah definitely i think it's you know take a leaf out of your kind of stereotypical social media user where you're like oh my god why why are they literally does everything they have to do in their life have to get broadcast across social media like take a yeah. take a learning from that because that's all that you're gonna do is you know look at your own social media usage what channels are you most comfortable on personally what do you enjoy using because at the end of the day you want you don't want it to be another chore. You want it to be something that fits seamlessly in with your current kind of creative habits in your day. Um, you know, let's say if you're, you know, if you just love Twitter, like personally, not really into Twitter, but some people really love it. And if that's where you've got a bit of a base on it, base level following, you've got an understanding of the various kind of nuances of the channel, then you'd be silly not to kind of lean into that, mm. just because you're like, oh, well, I have to be on the newest channel. I should be on TikTok. I, I hate to make a. A, a very political kind of situation about that but i hate to say it but the ultimate expression of somebody who understands their platform and how to get the most out of it was orange man for the last four years up until last week like <laughs> that is uh, that is i obviously i hate the I, I very severely dislike the man but you've got to admire the fact that i don't think another human being on the face of this earth understood twitter better than donald trump <laughs> exactly Exactly. So play to your strengths, and uh, rather than trying to swim upstream, go with the current. And um, yeah, select the channel. I think based on what you're most comfortable with and what maybe you've got a little bit of a affinity for anyway. And then yeah, very much just focus on you know documenting the process. Like you know if you're in the studio, then it's really easy to take like a little bit kind of video of it or a little still or try and fit in with the process. If you're out kind of. You know, mm. live, live stream it while you're in the process right yeah definitely so um there's a there's an artist up here in north west called cal johnston um he did an amazing uh he came onto my red, radar because he did this edit of um christ what was it uh not dump truck uh who's afraid of detroit i was gonna say it's not a bicep truck is it <laughs> no no surprisingly <laughs> So, and this is great because this example actually talks about a lot of things we did here. So Cal created an edit of um, of the track that I've just said and now has gone out of my window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but loads of DJs had it, never got released because it was an unofficial remix, but it got passed around, got passed to me. We started, Will and I started playing it. That's where it kind of came on my radar. radar. But without kind of going off down another tangent, what Cal does really, really well is that he records himself in the studio um, and let's say he's trying to decide between bass lines or between uh, vocal tops or something. He'll kind of record both and then he'll ask his social media following. Um, and whilst, you know, I'm a big subscriber to the fact that no one ever erected a statue of a crowd and it shouldn't be kind of like designed by committee. There's something really nice about documenting the process, but inviting the audience in to feel that they're in some way more emotionally involved in that process, that mm. you're taking on that journey with them. Mm. And I think that's just like, it's such a beautiful example of social media done right for for the majority of people, I mm. imagine, are listening to us tonight. Yeah. And it's a great, um, great situation, a great example of somebody who's on the more up and coming side of things on the other side of that scale. I've got to admit that I have watched an almost ungodly, unhealthy amount of disclosure on live streams <laughs> because they're so good. They're so good at it and they make you feel like they broke down every single track on their new album to like infinite detail and they make you feel like you were in the room with them when it was made. 
and and that is just such a beautiful thing for artists of that size and you know you watch their situation like you watch their streaming setups and it's like you can tell they've even thought well if we're going to stream we're going to do this to the best of our ability like we're going to put the same attention to detail into the stream and as we are into our tracks and that that's a, that's a wonderful wonderful thing so i, I love that I love that and you know big shout to Cal because he's someone I've known and respected for a long time so if you're listening mate nice one yeah definitely I think um, yeah it can be kind of super daunting and you know some people I know when we've done like the social media surgeries before have been like look you know I, I hate getting in front of the camera you know what else can I do and you know I, it doesn't mean to say everybody suddenly has to become like the kind of clown prince of tech house or something. And, you know, that's already been taken, I think, by a few artists. But it's about doing what you're comfortable with and trying to let what Paul's talked about to have some of your personality kind of shine through. So if you're really comfortable and a lot of your workflow is based around really obscure samples, then maybe it's kind of videos of the records that that's kind of come from because there's a value add. I'd follow you because that's the sort of thing I geek out over because I like a sample too. So it'd be like, oh my God, so this it, this sample came from this record and I'd be straight away going on Discogs and looking who the producer was and then trying to see mm. what other vinyl they are. And so it's just, I guess, uh, the point I'm illustrating is find something that works for you and don't feel that you have to be a certain way because no matter how you are, there's, there's avenues that you can explore that provide value mm. in different shapes and sizes. I mean, that takes me also as well to situations like the the treasure hunts for like you know the the tracks that burial sampled back in the day and you know you could almost like post up the the manipulated kind of mangled sample and then say to the say to the audience on whatever platform do you know what this is like can anyone guess Mm -hmm. what this sample is i think that's that's really really cool and that that appeals like across the board to you know artists who are sort of quite sample heavy you know from the membership i'm thinking people like cassine who does amazing work with samples and you know obscure you know videos and movies and reality tv shows of like you know various different aspects so you know that kind of thing is is really you know it's quite it's it's quite clever and it's quite easy to do and it's also you know something that you can inject a little bit of personality into it Mm. yeah definitely definitely and like the great thing is we live in a world now where all these things are available in video format online and can easily be repurposed Mm. and shared via social um which is not going to take too much time out of your day but i guess jumping off on that i think if you that's where you're probably going with this for wasn't it a little bit a little bit (laughs) might have been you've had me mind (laughs) so i think um the kind of the way i work and the way i've encouraged paul to work is uh to try and batch things up Mm -hmm. any kind of task uh and i apply this to like everything right down so for those of you who've probably listened to me speak before you'll know that i also make surf wax um so actually wrapping wax up rather than doing like each block at a time printing the wrapping stamping it folding the paper then tying it i break down each bit of the process and bulk batch it all up so i'll do all the printing all the wrapping then all the tying and do it in kind of that way because the, it just works out so much faster and so i'd recommend that you kind of do the same with your social media so if you've spent the week kind of going around your kind of studio bits capture all the content that you might want to use and then sit down with it on a sunday rather than trying to do it and break up your studio flow and your creativity, save it all. And then on a Sunday, then just kind of schedule it all in the one go. And there's some great scheduling tools out there. I tend to use a mixture between uh, a schedule on Facebook still, um, dabble in creative studio. I know Paul kind of really likes it. We were kind of discussing before we went on air uh, about the kind of the good bits and the kind of glitchy bits. Uh, I think Hootsuite's great for Instagram, although obviously you can use Creative Studio uh, as part of Facebook to then post on Instagram. Um, the downside, I suppose, of Hootsuite is because of the API, there's a few things you can't do because of new laws. So you can no longer location tag through Hootsuite, but obviously you can do uh, using Facebook's back end. So um, yeah, find your scheduling of choice and whether maybe you do schedule every other day knowing that it then gives you 
a day every other day you're then free to just kind of do on the fly content mm -hmm. that's kind of one method that works quite well i find myself sometimes doing or you know i might leave a couple of gaps in the week but i know if i'm going to be busy on a saturday then i'll just do saturday and sunday so then sunday morning i know i just need to do the week kind of coming in hand yeah sure and and the, th the thing is as well like going to create a studio for a minute obviously stuff like hootsuite and others are fantastic you know they, they are paid services so that that's something that you do have to bear in mind purely talking about instagram and facebook pages which you know, as we've just admitted, is not our primary focus as a business at the moment. You know, if you, if NYT was an artist, our pillar, as we've mentioned, is YouTube. Like that's where we predominantly put our efforts. Whether it's like as we mentioned before we came on air again, you know, we're, we're also refreshing and updating older content by changing things like thumbnails changing video descriptions tweaking things like links and end cards and stuff in order to generate more views and more subscribers and, that, and that's actually worked quite well for us in recent times and when it comes to instagram and facebook creator studio is is really handy for those sort of really basic things that you need to do like if you want to schedule your instagram posts for the entire week and then either not have to bother looking at it or as rory said spend a little bit of time every day just replying to comments or you know just engaging or putting stuff up on instagram stories that kind of thing it reduces the workload quite a bit and, and as rory's encouraged me to work over the years and we've had great success with it is you know sit there maybe like on a sunday afternoon or a Sunday evening, or you know, maybe even first thing on a Monday morning, if you have that kind of time, and spend an hour or half an hour or 45 minutes, whatever you need, to plan out and put your posts up for the week. And then you can just spend that little bit of time for the rest of the week actually just nurturing and, and replying to content, maybe dropping comments on other people's accounts, like you said before, Rory. And again, they mm. can be also posted across. You can also just tick a button and it'll go across your Facebook page as well, which will take care of that. I mean, obviously, organic reach being so low now on Facebook pages, it's like it's kind of maybe almost by the by a little bit. But, you know, better to, you know, have it than not have it, I suppose. But again, it just it mm. lends a degree of automation. But what it also does is it allows you to start thinking a little bit more strategically about what kind of content you're going to share and when, which could bring us into things like, you know, you you always talk about, you know, um, is it, uh, was it Think, Do, Delight, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And those type of, like, content buckets that you can almost categorise things into. So there's a different type of content being posted every day. But it's also the fact that, Again, you've almost got a kind of a, a longer term strategy of I'm going to post this type of content on this day to keep it fresh and keep it mixed up rather than just constantly, you know, posting videos of cats sitting on synthesizers. Mm. <laughs> Which, you know, is in no way a bad thing. I didn't say it was but a yeah, bad thing. If you, like... do... <laughs> <laughs> if you do want to get a, like more strategic with it, then that's definitely right where scheduling at the best comes into its own uh, creative studio is just added in their new kind of calendar function on it mm -hmm. so you can kind of see everything listed out across the days and it's it's great having that top down view because you can start to see oh hang on a minute i've got like three posts in a row there where i'm either asking someone to listen to a mix or buy a track or download something maybe it would work better if i got the cats and synthesizers and broke it up a little bit in between um and that kind of comes into it and to um, unpack what you said there about the kind of see, think, do, delight. That's looking at kind of content funnels. We talked about our fan funnel. Then we have a content funnel, which sort of uses the same the same kind of um, concept of at the top, we're trying to generate awareness. So this is where your kind of memes or more shareable content sits that's getting you in front of those new eyeballs. And then as we're bringing them down, to use NYT as an example, the think level is what traditionally marketers call the consideration phase. Mm. So people that are aware of you as a brand, but they just need a little bit more information before they're going to buy. So it's like, you know, am I going to get the most value out of this course, which of course you are, but you know, they might need a little bit of content that helps bring that to life, whether it be testimonials or whether it be more free content that shows kind of thought leadership in space. And then your do content is 
those bits where you're asking for a specific action from your audience. So you're not providing any value, you're just asking for them to do something in return. Um, so that's kind of how that kind of breaks down a little bit. And it's, um, it's a little bit, I guess, more different, slightly more different as an artist because the consideration phase is different in terms of you're not like, am I going to get value for money? How that applies to you as an artist is more about building that emotional connection mm. from when they kind of come in at the top and might first hear some music of yours, whether it be on a streaming platform or maybe they've seen a clip that, you know, maybe Hernan Castaneo has played your track and someone's seen it on uh, on YouTube because there's a video going around, if you clicked on it, come to your artist's profile. In order to get them to that true fan stage, they've kind of got to feel like they know you a little bit. And so that's kind of where the consideration phase or the think phase, that's how it applies to you guys as artists or DJs. It's the content that draws people in where you're kind of just sharing a little bit of yourself with people. Um, you hear a lot about artists, you know, like, you know, in the bigger, wider world about like, you know, sharing a little bit of their souls with audiences and leaving a little bit of themselves on stage and all these kind of like quite lofty ideas. Mm -hmm. But I think as an artist, you are putting yourself out there and, in terms of, I guess that's what they mean about suffering for your art somehow, somewhat. Mm. You do need to leave a little bit of yourself out there and exposed, and that's that's what we're kind of talking about there, mm. without getting all misty. No, it's true. It's <laughs> true. Even from personal experience, like you know, performing, that's definitely true. And even in the context of you know stuff like this, and and even in the context of what we do here at NYT, it's it, the more honest I am with myself, and the more. And, and again, this is a very overused word, but the more sort of vulnerable I am and the more open I become with people through this platform, the more it seems to resonate. So mm. that is a great way of breaking through that mental barrier of I have to get this person to download my track on Beatport. Do you know what I mean? It's like, again, it becomes more about creating and fostering an authentic, real connection with people. And, you know, that might lead as a byproduct of that to greater success where your art's concerned because people feel more invested in you as a human being because you've just showed them that you're, for want of a better expression, real. You know, you're not mm. fake. You're not, you're not putting it on. You're not trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. And I think, again, that leads nice and kind of conveniently you know quite neatly full circle almost to that thing of well don't be that me to artist is the way that patrice put it in his instagram post and don't be what you think other people think you should be you know that kind of openness and that kind of vulnerability goes a hell of a long way so you know it's it's definitely amazing advice where that's concerned so in terms of as we were saying before about not letting it overtake your life then that level that little bit of like personal organization and using the correct tools is is highly highly uh useful i mean do you have anything to sort of add on that in terms of the, the scheduling aspect and being able to make sure that you know you've you, you're getting the uh, impact that you want without it as i say you know costing a huge amount of time yeah i think um there's a few little hacks i guess that sit around that so you know you've got insights on pretty much every social platform now around the best time to post so when your mm. audience are predominantly online what I like to do is if you look at the kind of the peak of usage, if you go for the hour before, then what that enables is your whatever content to get a bit of momentum as more and more people come online. Whereas if you post at the top of the peak, the the kind of thinking is that people are then dropping off then. So even if it does get momentum, you're then trying to it's almost like you're riding a wave and the wave's getting smaller and you're trying to go higher. And it's not gonna happen. So I think using those insights and scheduling around the best time of day is a good little hack. Uh, another one that I live by is um, I save my kind of hashtags um, in my uh, notes app on my iPhone um, and I have that synced uh, using my iCloud so it's also my notes on my MacBook so whenever I'm kind of posting I can just quickly copy and paste that into the captions um, so that saves a load of time as well rather than trying to just come up with different hashtags for every one and trying to remember what they were. Mm -hmm. That makes it a lot quicker. Um, I think there's tools as well, also, isn't there, specifically to Instagram, where you can research yeah. what the most popular hashtags are or what get the most, you know, the most traction. Yeah. yeah, definitely. 
So you'd say you want to try and get a mixture of, you want the kind of larger and more popular hashtags, which are going to hopefully generate reach because they've got a lot of people searching them. But then you also want slightly smaller hashtags where you've got a better chance of hitting the explore page on that hashtag. So like very kind of quick top level hashtag strategy is creating that mix. So I don't know if you're putting tech house in, tech house is probably going to be oversaturated, but is there like, is hashtag banging tech house, let's say, still popular, but a little less popular, so you're more likely to be able to rank for it. Mm. Um, and then just kind of going through a selection and that gives you your kind of hashtags, which you can then save to Evernote or whatever notes mm. app you're using and then it's got, mm. just got it. Mm. Um, also, um, a quick hack on Facebook for finding kind of shareable content is when you're browsing, you can save posts. So using the save post function to kind of build stuff up across the week to then schedule for the next week. And then if you find there's pages that are always delivering that sort of content, if you go into your artist page and then go and search for these channels, you can then follow them as your page. And then there's, uh, it's probably changed now somewhere, but basically on your profile, there's a link which enables you to see the pages that you follow the feed. Mm. So that's a really great, great way of getting a, curated feed for content that you might want to share um i to think what other hacks there are uh that kind of save on the time and they're the biggies uh, oh and i guess another one is looking as well and it's good instagram hack uh facebook as well actually i would say is utilize reddit if you're not already using it and um pinterest are two great platforms for sourcing content um generally like most of the kind of viral videos that you might see on on you know facebook or instagram or on the reels platform they tend to have actually come from reddit first um so the great thing there is you can download them there there's reddit and video downloaders and you can share them that way mm. so that's a nice little app as well no totally and going back to what you were saying about instagram hashtags and finding smaller hashtags that have a you know a I suppose what you call a lower degree of difficulty in mm -hmm. cutting through that reminds me very much of strategies that you can use on youtube as well now to be honest i could do a whole course just on youtube itself and what it takes and the the kind of the interest of it and obviously we're still part way through our journey at nyt of growing our channel we are by no means the biggest channel on youtube but we don't. We are growing, but there are there are amazing tools for this, such as VidIQ and Tube Buddy as well, and they have great insight for things like uh, not just SEO for those platforms. And again, they're three letters when they're put together strike fear into the heart of most mortal men and women, you know. But it's also the fact that you can do things like keyword competition scoring. So what it will do, especially on vidIQ, you put in, like, like you were saying, like hashtag tech house or just tech house. It will give you, for that particular search term, it will give you a, a rating based on what the search volume is compared to the amount of like competition there is, essentially. So you mm. can find something with say for example like a hashtag let's say for example like again tech house tech house could have high search volume but there could be a very low amount of videos that are actually serving that particular search term which means that you then have an opportunity to get into that space and be able to create content that people are not only searching for but their your videos are going to come higher up the search rankings. Now, again, like the the two videos that I've made before, the, the reference to one, which was the Logic Audio to MIDI uh, video we did, like back I think in like twenty thirteen. It's like seven years old, <laughs> and again, it's like it's like it's got nearly three hundred thousand hits now because we were literally the only video on YouTube for about five years that did anything to do with that. It wasn't as if it was like, you know, the, the most searched for thing on YouTube, clearly. But we accidentally hit upon a niche that loads of people 
were searching for but nobody was making videos on so if you can spend a bit of time on that where you know you can find out what relevant to you as an artist what kind of search terms because again you, you get what you would call the long tail search term so you, you see the keyword if you will the tech house keyword if you put banging on the beginning of it or you modify it or lengthen it in some way what it does is that it makes the search term a little less popular or a little less kind of generalized a little more specific but what it can do is that it can provide enough niche in order for you to find terms that you can dominate um and again like sort of talking about you know seo for artists and stuff like that amazing amazing tools that we've been using for nyt strategy like answer the mm-hmm. things like that and also um a great seo expert who is you know great on things like youtube and on facebook and stuff the guy i would definitely recommend called neil patel and he puts loads of like free courses out on youtube He's a, he's a really, really, like the really good, really su- succinct courses with like downloadable content. They're all free. They're all run via YouTube, essentially. But he also has this um, really interesting SEO tool called Uber Suggest, which is free. And, you know, some of these SEO tools, as you'll know, like Ahrefs and some of the others can be very, very expensive. And you can learn a tremendous amount by just having that, say, for example, the Uber Suggest plugin installed on like your Google Chrome. Because what it will do every time you go to Google or YouTube, because again, Google is the number one search engine in the world, obviously. YouTube is the number two search engine in the world and it's owned by the same people who own number one. So it's a really interesting thing because you start to look at YouTube like rather than a platform for video-based entertainment, you start to look at it as where Google is a search engine. YouTube is like an answer engine. And you start to reflect on your own behavior on YouTube, so to speak. So if you're looking for a live stream from a certain DJ or a certain you know, style of music, that kind of thing, you can modify these search terms to find things that people are looking for that nobody else is really angling their content towards. And what's great with the Uber Suggest plugin is that when you type in a search term, it'll actually give you a breakdown next to it, how many people are searching for it per month on YouTube or Google, and how much the cost per click is if you're going to do paid advertising, which gives you even more insight into how these things can be leveraged, even if you aren't going to pay for advertising. So, Mm. you know, just to sort of give the roundness of all the platforms we've talked about, you know, Instagram, Facebook, and and therefore just, you know, I've just chipped in with the platform that I do know quite well. There's, There's a plethora of different tools available that you can really cut your teeth on and again learn to leverage it so it is it is the 80 20 rule right it's that pareto principle of 80 percent of the return that you get needs to come from just 20 percent of your efforts so again batching knowing your audience being able to schedule things in advance being able to curate things and be able to put that little bit of time every week to be able to line these things up so you can focus on being creative is the most important thing and that is the key to be able to do your marketing and be able to generate awareness in a way that doesn't cost you hours upon hours of screen time and you know leads to you know just feeling terrible because you're sat in a lockdown and you're just looking at your phone all day yeah yeah no definitely and i think you know we've got You've got screen time apps and stuff, so it's easy to kind of monitor your usage and be more mindful of that. And and I think just set, get into the habit, get into routine, and set kind of set some goals, but also set some behaviours that then kind of will, if you if you complete all of them, will ultimately lead to you hitting that goal. Mm. Make that kind of like you know foolproof path. So whether that be if you're thinking, God, you know, I really need to start building that actual physical network physical audience rather than kind of the digital audience and be like okay well you know this week each week i'm going to reach out to one new artist that i really like and leave a kind of try and leave a comment 
and just kind of have that and have that written down and just start trying to tick it off and just doing it and being like, okay, well, if Sunday I'm going to schedule my socials and Monday I'm going to reach out and contact, try and contact artists and just kind of have those set blocks of time, much in the same way that Paul, you know, teaches music production and segmenting those different bits of the process and only focusing on that one, one period of time is exactly the same with kind of how to do your marketing and stuff and just batch it up. Mm, absolutely absolutely that's definitely the way forward so you know hopefully what we've discussed on you know this particular masterclass and you know in this edition of the podcast we've you know we, we've kind of thrown a little bit of insight onto like how to leverage all of this so again it can be something that you have to do something that you need to do obviously you know we like to call it possibly a necessary evil at some stages but it is honestly something that you can do to generate your audience and do it in a near automated way so you can focus on the reason why you got into this in the first place which is because you love the music and you love making music and you love performing music and you love making people happy exactly that simples simples <laughs> simples when you put it like that in it do you know what i mean <laughs> cool cool so yeah mate this has been an absolute blast mate and I've I've really really enjoyed it. I always enjoy it when we get together. We should do it more often. And I think, based on what we've been talking about in recent days, I think it is going to become a bit more of a regular thing. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a, some nice things we've looked at there. From you know, whether it be owning your audience and um, how do we then embrace that kind of DIY ethos? You know, maybe that's something we should look back up. Maybe get some people on where we talk about like delve into what it takes to actually start a label and launch them in band camp um but also you know how do we get people a little bit more business savvy when it comes to those music rights and things mm. um so definitely some good future things that i reckon we can dig into which people are going to want to know the answers to no amazing absolutely and you know again there's people who are active within the membership who already have experience of this like Clyde for example mm -hmm. with his experiments last year on Spotify and you know I've been encouraging a number of artists to look at Bandcamp and be able to sort of move in that kind of direction and you know again it's it's about empowerment it's about sovereignty as an artist and you know this there's quite a it's quite late in the day to make such a profound point but you know it's treating your art with the respect that it deserves because how you treat your art is often a reflection of how you treat yourself and how you view yourself and how you value yourself. You know, I, I love, again, that's a complete tangent, but I love that thing of, you know, the famous incident with Picasso and the handkerchief where he sat in a restaurant and he's kind of doodling. And uh, this lady says to him, Oh, can I have that? Like, because that's just, you know, a Picasso, a, a handkerchief, you know, drawn on a handkerchief at a restaurant table. It's like, it's it's amazing. Like, can I can I have that? And he says, yes, but that'll cost you $20,000. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, what do you mean? It's just a drawing on a on a, on a a handkerchief, like it, or a napkin. Like, it'll, it took you five minutes. And he goes, no, my dear, it took me 40 years. And he puts the handkerchief <laughs> in his pocket and he walks out the restaurant. And it's the fair's bill. Well, well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> but but the the principle of it that's great. I've probably butchered that story, so I'll just I'll, I'll caveat that straight away. But the 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 model of the story or the the meaning to take from the story is that you know Picasso valued his art and he understood that the his art, no matter how small, was an artifact and is an artifact that if you value it in the right way even in the process of creating it, you're going to create something that's going to stand the test of time and it's going to become timeless and it's going to become something that is going to sustain you in the same way as, you know, a pension, uh, you know, owning, owning Bitcoin or as it is nowadays or owning shares in a company or having a nest egg or, you know, having, a, having property to call your own, that kind of thing. You know, these things can become appreciable assets. And I think electronic music has for a long time been very guilty of not treating, by and large, its own music with the same kind of value. So hopefully this is going to, you know, this situation, one of the positives of this situation is that that's going to change. 
So there you go. As Craig just said there, don't undersell yourself. That's what it's about. And again, like all, all of these strategies we've talked about tonight is talking about how, you know, we can we can help you do that. And as Rory mentioned, we're going to get into this in subsequent you know, subsequent calls and subsequent pieces of content on the on AAA, where we'll look at how to leverage your bank camp correctly, how to set up these funnels, how to set up direct communication strategies between you and your, you know, your audience and your sort of fan base, and how to build that fan base in a much more practical way. Tonight was very much the sort of the open and shot, really, the open and salvo of all of that. So, you know, let 2021 be the uh, be the year that the punk ethos in dance music was reborn and it's to the betterment of, of all artists where we can finally start to make a sustainable living from our art once again. Thanks once again, mate. This has been absolutely fantastic and uh, let's not leave it so long next time, yeah? <laughs> definitely mate no thank you for having me it's been a pleasure and um yeah for everyone listening you know if you if you've tried any of the things you've heard tonight and had any success or you maybe tried it and you think oh, i didn't quite get that right i wasn't sure what i was doing then um yeah give us a shout comment on some of the posts hit us up on social uh, let us know i've got on or if you need some help and we'll do our best indeed indeed so yeah that's gonna do it for tonight and uh yeah looking forward to uh, digging into the rest of the content on nyt in the subsequent time so yeah thanks very much guys and i shall see you very very soon take it easy Catch new episodes of Beyond the Studio every single week on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts.